I hope that this presentation can offer you um, some insight and some useful material to help you engage your students around the topic of Latinx civil rights um, in the post-World War II period. Uh, so it's been a while since I've uh, participated in one of these programs and um, you know the standards have changed a little bit uh, but much of the central sort of core ideas really remain. Um, you know the standard asks for students to be able to describe uh, the role of political organizations that promoted civil rights, including Chicano organizations. Um, it asked students to be able to identify significant figures and leaders like Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, um, and also to be able to kind of explain the changes that resulted from civil rights activism, including uh, more participation in the political process. Um, as I was looking through the standards, um, I saw Latinos mentioned in other parts of the standards that I think also have resonance for our topic today. Um, you know, they were mentioned under the government section uh, where there was a reference to students' knowledge of major Supreme Court cases, including Hernandez v. Texas. I'll pass very quickly over Hernandez v. Texas in my comments today. Um, and also under the section on culture, um, the, the standard um, calls for students to be able to describe the impact of the Chicano mural movement. Um, you know, I'll, I'll try to squeeze that in as well, um, but really that, that sort of artistic movement is, is sort of an outgrowth of the uh, Chicano movement and the civil rights movement. So they're really very uh, interconnected. Um, and so I'll try to make some reference to that here as well. So when I teach, and I regularly teach the first half of the required Texas uh, history sequence, so the Texas, or the second half, excuse me, so Texas since 1865, um, and so civil rights is a central thread when I teach my classes, and, and it's a, an important element of my classes. Um, and when I teach civil rights in um, here at the University of Houston, I approach the topic with sort of three framing or kind of guiding questions, um, things that I want students to be able to learn and to, um, to kind of grapple with over the course of the semester. Um, first is definitions. How do we define civil rights? Um, what issues did Latino communities face? What were the um, things that they were fighting for? And on what grounds did they assert their claims to civil rights? Second, what were the different strategies to achieving civil rights? Um, and here, I think it's important to get students to understand uh, the, um, the roots of civil rights activism really don't begin just at, in the mid 20th century, but they extend further back in time. Um, they are, uh, you know, really central to, to kind of understanding the lives of, um, of various ethnic communities. Um, and, and so we, we really want to understand those roots. Um, we also want to think about how there were various forms of protest um, and there could be you know, sort of civil rights activism through courts and through legal cases, uh, through the political process, um, but that civil rights activism also occurred at the grassroots and through labor organizations. And I'll say a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, and how these approaches really were dependent and determined uh, based on the time period, um, in terms of access, in terms of class position, uh, you know, that, that all of these factors were going to shape what kinds of strategies were available at any given time. And third, and I think probably most importantly, um, what does Latino civil rights uh, history teach us about American history, about uh, these communities? Um, and here, I think this is a crucial part. How do we place the, the uh, civil rights movement of Latinos within the context of American history and, and really show how Latino history is in many ways American history? I think this question also encourages us to help students connect uh, the past to the present and for them to see the relevance of civil rights activism in the past in their lives today. Um, you know, when I've, I've taught these uh, workshops in the past, I know sometimes teachers will say that their students really struggle um, because they, they can't make those direct connections to um, what happened, you know, in the 50s or in the 40s um, to what is relevant in their lives. And I think that by kind of framing this in, in sort of these larger enduring 
questions and these um, larger uh, uh, values that, uh, that are at the core of civil rights, um, I think this helps students make those connections um, and to be able to answer, how does this history matter to me and my life and my community? Uh, so first, you know, how do we define civil rights? Um, so I want to start actually with um, a, a bit of a disclaimer or a caveat. Um, you know, the title of the uh, presentation I was asked to give focused on um, Latinx civil rights. Um, and when we think of Latinx or Latino civil rights, really we're speaking of diverse communities from a number of different national origins and experiences in the United States. And so that means each of these communities are going to have um, distinctive factors that shape their own history. Uh, so for example, Puerto Ricans are gonna have a very different experience from Cubans versus Mexican Americans versus people from Latin America and Central America. And so I think it's important to recognize that they all have distinct historical paths, um, different concerns and also are gonna have very different approaches to civil rights activism. Um, for our purpose here today, I want to focus primarily on the Mexican American experience, um, you know, mostly because the standard itself identifies Mexican American individuals or movements. It makes very specific reference to the Chicano movement, which is, um, you know, sort of tied to the Mexican experience in the United States. But hopefully I can also help you find ways to um, see where there may be some overlap in ways that you can bring in other um, Latino groups into the conversation about civil rights. When we're thinking about definitions, um, you know, I often ask my students, you know, what, what do we mean by civil rights? What, what are the things that are guaranteed when we talk about fighting for, for a group's rights? Um, you know, of course, we address the very specific institutional barriers to equal protections and access. Um, and so students will mention um, segregation and segregation in public facilities or segregation in schools. Um, we talk about voting rights or the lack of access to voting um, and, and eliminating barriers to, to participation in the political process. Uh, service on juries, uh, you know, so for example, the Hernandez v. Texas case really highlights jury service as an important um, duty of, of, uh, of citizens. Um, and also thinking about the protection of rights through for th things like due process. Um, but what I also encourage to think, students to think about are the larger systemic issues that are intertwined with these uh, very specific um, uh, rights and responsibilities. So for them to think about, for example, economic um, disenfranchisement and poverty, um, the right to equal pay and just working conditions. Um, and even beyond that, um, a, a sense of inclusion and a sense of belonging in society, uh, being able to have a voice in, uh, in society and in the political process. You know, later in the 20th century, we see civil rights groups uh, very much pushing for uh, what they call self-determination. So this um, sort of uh, belief in being able to determine one's path for oneself, right? That, that goes beyond even just these, these very, you know, specific, um, you know, things that we associate with civil rights. Um, so self-determination becomes important. And really what we're talking about is the search for and the quest for treatment, um, you know, that's just basic human dignity. And we'll see that a little bit in the, the document that I have uh, to share with you today. Um, I think that this is really critical to move beyond just very specific issues um, and to think about these bigger questions um, because it allows uh, students to not only cultivate historical thinking, but also to cultivate a sense of empathy, which is really something that is at the core of my, um, you know, sort of philosophy and belief in, in why history is such a valuable subject to, to teach. So I think it's critical to think about the kind of discrimination that uh, people of Latino heritage and Mexican American heritage in particular um, experienced. And this could take many, many different forms. Um, I mentioned the internal diversity among Latino communities, uh, but that diversity was also very present and is very present in Mexican origin communities. Um, they're also very internally diverse. Uh, you know, for uh, much of the 20th century and even today, uh, many can trace their origins uh, back in the Southwest for many generations. And uh, these were descendants of people who became citizens by virtue of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. 
descendants of Spanish settlers um, and previous waves of, of colonization. Um, it's also a community that consists of more recent immigrant communities. Um, we would begin to see rising numbers of Mexican immigrants coming into the United States, particularly in the 19 teens as the result of the Mexican Revolution and coming into the late 20th century. Um, and these communities of, of uh, these immigrant communities would would kind of grow, not just in the Southwest, but in other parts of the United States. Often these people following uh, migrant labor trails, so uh, in agriculture, in industry, moving into the Midwest and even into the East. Um, these communities varied along lines of socioeconomic class, of generation, of length of time in the United States, um, and even racial identity. Um, but despite this reality of difference and, um, and diversity within a community, often Mexican Americans were viewed as a, a, a foreign uh, community and racially distinct or racially other, despite the fact that, that there was all this variation. Um, their position in the United States uh, was precarious and fragile. And despite the fact that they were considered to be legally white uh, by virtue of, of the, the language of the treaty, um, they were often viewed as racially other regardless of, of their, um, their racial status. Um, and factors like naturalization, um, and uh, uh, complexion and uh, economic standing all could serve as markers of racial difference. Economically, while there was a small middle class of business owners and professionals in major cities throughout the 20th century, um, a great majority of people of Mexican origin were also locked in low wage, low paying and lower skilled positions regardless of their training and their education level. Um, this was often the result of uh, lobbying done by legislators in the, in the U.S. who lobbied Congress for exemptions to uh, immigration law that would allow Mexican laborers to enter the United States to work. Um, and it was often predicated on really harmful stereotypes uh, that uh, described Mexican laborers as uh, physiologically suited to, um, to, to very hard and, um, and grueling uh, physical labor. Uh, they also argued that Mexican immigrant laborers were always temporary, that they would work and that they would return home. They often use the term birds of passage. Um, and so the effect of this is to kind of create this idea that this was a, a temporary um, uh, group that would return home that was perhaps not um, uh, you know, sort of worthy of citizenship rights, not worthy of a sense of belonging. Um, and, um, and it often helped to, to justify substandard living conditions um, in, uh, in large cities and um, in, in small communities. Uh, many, um, many people of Mexican origin lived in overcrowded barrios that had very few services, no indoor plumbing, no electricity. Uh, there were also restrictive covenants that often kept those who, who did have economic means um, from moving into um, other parts of town. So this discrimination on an economic level, I think was something that was really significant. Educationally, Mexican students' opportunities were also limited and resources here were also substandard. Um, despite not being legally segregated uh, by race, Mexican students were often separated in, um, in other ways and, and things like language or perceived lack of intelligence often justified the creation of Mexican schools, actual separate facilities in some uh, Southwestern cities. Um, even in places where there were no separate Mexican schools, the children of Mexican descent would be separated from the, uh, the white children in, in those schools. Uh, Mexican schools often had inferior physical facilities. Uh, they sometimes didn't have indoor plumbing, as you can see in this, um, this particular image here from, um, from the 1940s. Uh, they often received less funding. Uh, teachers and administrators who worked in these schools received less pay than teachers that worked in white schools. Um, often Mexican children were um, sort of uh, put into a vocational track as opposed to a college preparatory track. And socially, 
people of Latino heritage encountered a range of discriminatory practices. In some cases, um, and in some cities, venues like city parks, public facilities, um, restaurants, um, would um, were off limits to, to Latino, or they were only allowed in certain sections of those facilities, or they were only allowed to use them certain, during certain days of the week. Now, although again, Latinos were considered legally white, uh, this segregation was maintained by custom and by everyday practice. Um, these signs here really kind of speak to the rules that existed um, in, in many communities um, that, that reinforced separation that was as powerful as law. Um, you know, this, this kind of everyday practice was also something that was, that was really, um, you know, again, not mandated by law, but the, but the practice reinforced it as, as powerfully as if it were. So what were the different strategies? You know, sort of how did people respond to these conditions and, and what were their uh, various efforts to be able to try to dismantle this, uh, this kind of architecture of segregation and um, to, to bring forth a fight for civil rights? Um, I wanna talk about three categories that align with the standards. Um, and I think that they offer some interesting and uh, really helpful ways to help you um, encourage students to understand the Latino civil rights movement also in comparison with other um, organizations um, and other uh, communities. Uh, the first is civil rights through formal organizations, civil rights through grassroots activism and protests, and the third is labor activism. Um, unfortunately, I'm watching the, the clock just quickly speed by, um, and so I don't have a lot of time to go into great depth, but I do want to offer you a few quick ways for you to see how you might draw from these examples to show the diversity of approaches uh, that were employed at different points across time. And of course, I'm happy to delve more deeply into these in the Q&A period or, um, or even following this presentation. The first of these organizations is one that you're probably already pretty familiar with, the League of United Latin American Citizens. Um, and this is, I guess, a really good example of um, the path to securing civil rights through major political organizations. Um, LULAC was founded in 1929 in Corpus Christi, Texas, um, and it very much employed a strategy of asserting rights grounded in citizenship rights. Um, so grounded in US citizenship and, and also service to the United States. Um, you know, even before 1929, uh, Mexican communities were uh, organizing uh, for, to protect their rights and to find relief against discrimination. Um, these uh, efforts tended to be focused on mutual aid societies and also um, appealing to the Mexican consulate. So really identifying as, you know, sort of um, members of the Mexican um, citizenry and Mexican state. But organizations like LULAC really kind of represent a shift in this orientation. Uh, the members tended to be largely middle class business owners, um, skilled workers, uh, lawyers, and some professionals were, were among the membership. Many of them were veterans of World War I. And they really focused their attention on assimilation as a path to, uh, to civil rights. They emphasized citizenship. English uh, language acquisition for its membership and also for members of the Mexican population as a whole. Um, you know, they were criticized at the time for um, for being for having this limited perspective, right? That in in emphasizing citizenship and emphasizing um, the English language, that they were very much cutting off a large group of the Mexican population. Um, but really, scholars have pointed to how LULAC was operating out of a very distinct set of circumstances that was available to, to them in South Texas in the early part of the 20th century. So for them, this was the citizenship strategy was an, a, a way to access the political system. With citizenship came the right to vote, and with the right to vote came political power through the electoral process. Um, and they believe that using this tactic would, in the end, help all Latinos. And so LULAC, uh, throughout the, the 1940s and 50s, launched a variety of campaigns targeting areas where segregation and discrimination prevented Mexican origin people from being able to fully exercise their civic duties. 
uh, they filed a number of legal cases uh, against segregation in public schools. So it was LULAC lawyers who filed the cases in Mendez v. Westminster, the case in California in 1946 that ended segregation in California. Um, they were also involved in various cases in Texas, including the Delgado v. Bastrop case in 1948. Um, in, in the 1950s, it was LULAC lawyers that filed the case that became Hernandez v. Texas, which challenged discrimination against Mexicans in jury selection. It was also the first case that was argued by Mexican-American lawyers before the United States Supreme Court. And what's interesting here is that although they emphasize the citizenship, by the 1950s, the argument in Hernandez v. Texas really showed how the legal whiteness that was um, in theory afforded to people of Mexican origin really didn't prevent sy systemic discrimination and disenfranchisement. I want to drop in here really quickly um, another organization that I think is really interesting and that might actually be a way to um, get students uh, to, to see the presence of Latinos in, 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 um, from other groups. Um, and so I'll mention very briefly this organization, El Congreso de Pueblos de Habla Española, or the Spanish-speaking People's Congress, or simply El Congreso. Uh, it's among the first uh, national civil rights groups that took a broader view of Latino civil rights. Um, El Congreso was relatively short-lived, um, really from like the, the late 30s to about the early 1950s. Um, and although it was initially intended to be a national organization, it really was strongest in California, in Southern California especially. Um, and it was distinct from LULAC in several key and really interesting ways um, that I think reflect the range of approaches to civil rights uh, by large organizations. Um, El Congreso was led by the veteran labor organizer, um, Luisa Moreno, and that's Luisa Moreno there on the left. Uh, and she helped organize the first conference that was held in Los Angeles in 1939. And it, this conference brought together a number of activists who were already working on Latino issues, um, including Josefina Fierro de Bright, who's pictured there on the right hand side. Um, Josefina Fierro de Bright was a, um, a woman who uh, was born in Mexico, came to the United States as a, as a child, and um, was really dedicated to a variety of civil rights activities um, in, in Los Angeles. Um, and at this conference, uh, they were brought together, they came together to discuss and address issues related to discrimination in jobs, in housing, in health, um, and education, and they also discussed immigrant rights. So unlike LULAC, uh, El Congreso really recognized the intertwined experiences of immigrants and native-born Latinos alike. And they included people from um, different backgrounds and different national um, origins. Uh, and another thing that was really interesting to me and that I think is, is unique about El Congreso is that women rose to uh, really high leadership positions. Uh, women like Josefina Fierro de Bright and Luisa Moreno, uh, which is very different from LULAC. LULAC had separate women's auxiliary councils, but the leadership of the organization uh, was, was entirely male. Um, and so here you have women really involved in, in, the, um, in, this, in this group, in this organization. They drafted a really inclusive uh, platform that uh, called for a greater political representation for Latinos, um, emphasizing immigrants' rights uh, to work and live in the United States, um, they called for uh, universities to create Latino studies programs, uh, and they also called for things like bilingual education. Um, unfortunately, much of the promise of this very forward-thinking platform uh, went unrealized. Uh, El Congreso, as many civil rights organizations um, throughout the 20th century were, uh, was the target of red baiting. Um, and uh, unfortunately, they didn't ever realize that full national organization potential that they, that they hoped to achieve. Um, but I think it's, it's significant for what they advocated and when. Um, and it's a, it's a good way to introduce some of these um, kind of broader issues. Another kind of category that I think is really valuable is grassroots activism. And again, very interrelated with the approach, um, many different approaches to civil rights. And I think by focusing on grassroots activism, we really get our students to see how individuals and communities 
stood against the discrimination that they encountered in very localized and specific ways. Um, one of my very favorite examples to use in class is the student walkouts of the 1960s. In particular, and I think this would be really useful for, for you all as well, um, many of these walkouts were initiated and launched by high school students. Uh, these occurred throughout the Southwest. Uh, there were walkouts in Los Angeles and large school districts and large cities, um, and also in smaller communities here in Texas, including Ed Couch, Elsa, and Crystal City. And here students and parents protested a range of issues, um, the low graduation rates for students of Mexican heritage, uh, the fact that students were punished for speaking Spanish on school grounds, the racist treatment by teachers and administrators, um, and also the funneling of students into um, to vocational programs and not college prep programs. They also protested the, full la uh, the, the lack of full inclusion um, into the life of the community and the life of their schools. Uh, one of the issues that was raised by the students in Crystal City, for example, in 1969, was the process by which the cheerleading squad was selected. Um, you know, students noticed that um, initially the, 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 the girls that were chosen for the cheerleading squad were selected by a, a vote by the student body. But as the number of Mexican-American students in the school flipped, um, they changed the, the policy such that a committee selected the cheerleaders. And so, you know, kind of thinking about these big systemic issues and these small day-to-day -day issues, um, I think really kind of is, is unique, um, a unique opportunity to get students to, to grapple with the fundamental concerns of, of these various groups. Um, you know, and even though they were they were raising these issues, they were really highlighting some systemic problems. Um, another critique that was raised by the uh, parents and students at Crystal City was the process by which uh, elected officials and school uh, administrators were elected during the summer. This was a period when many Mexican families who were migrant laborers um, left town and were on the migrant labor trail. And so they were not able to participate in selecting um, you know, the, the people who would make decisions. And so they were really pointing a, to some, some really important systemic issues um, that were barriers to full inclusion. And I think grassroots activism emphasizes this new approach that, that kind of highlights generational difference and, um, and change along class lines. Um, organizations like the Mexican American Youth Organization were very unlike older groups like LULAC. Uh, they stressed a politicized Chicano identity. They called for active um, demonstrations and to, you know, to protest in, um, in, by walking out of classrooms. And they really highlighted the urgency of the moment. Um, you know, not much had changed. We, we think about what is happening and what the students in, um, in these schools were experiencing in the 1960s from what was happening in the 1930s and 40s. Um, and so really highlighting this urgency um, and this push for self-determination, the right to celebrate one's cultural her heritage, the right to learn about one's history and see it not as a source of shame, but a source of pride. Um, and also to be able to claim and to live a life of, of dignity. Um, and so I think this is a really excellent example for, for high school students. Um, I wanna quickly shift to the third approach, um, which is really is the focus of our document for today. Um, and this explores the interconnections between civil rights and labor rights. Again, another very, very long history of labor activism among Latino people going back into the 19th century and into moving forward into the 20th century. Um, but the most important point here is um, to highlight the ways that various forms of union activism are deeply interconnected with the issues at the heart of the civil rights movement. So labor history is really more than just a study of shop floor politics or specific union contracts or, um, or issues. Um, we really need to think more broadly about how people experience work and how work shapes their lives. Um, a focus on Latino labor activism shows how poverty within Latino communities was tied to discrimination in wages and working and living conditions. Um, for generations, the nation's farm workers had labored in really inhumane conditions. 
Uh, they earned pitiful wages and experienced horrific work and living conditions. Um, they were among and and agricultural workers are in many ways still among the most exploited and vulnerable workers in the United States. So aside from the specific demands regarding um, you know, pay rate and wages, the farm worker movement um, prioritized principles of human dignity and the right to self-determination. And so I think it's important to ask students, you know, as we're kind of looking at this case in, in um, the case of Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta and the farm workers movement, how did their activism around living in fair wages and just labor practices um, relate to bigger issues of fairness and justice for working class Latino communities? Um, and another kind of interesting thing here that I think links these different categories together is that Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta had both worked as farm laborers. So they had been migrant laborers and worked in the fields, um, but they were also both experienced community organizers. Uh, they had both uh, been a part of the community service organization, the CSO, um, and, and learned under the, uh, the organizer, um, no, uh, a man named Fred Ross. And so they had, they had really cut their teeth in working in like a civil rights political organization before going into uh, you know, organizing farm workers. Uh, together they formed the National Farm Workers Association in 1962. Um, and this was part of another larger movement. Um, Filipino farm workers had been organizing uh, and attempting to organize farm workers under the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee or AWOC. And they had spearheaded the 1965 grape strikes. Um, and eventually the two organizations merged and became uh, the United Farm Workers. So our document today is, um, is, is from this movement. It's from uh, the, uh, the, the pilgrimage, the march from Delano to Sacramento in 1966 to draw attention to the plight of farm workers. Um, and here I want us, when we, we kind of break out into that session, I want us to focus on what the specific issues were that, um, you know, that the authors of this document were, were raising and how were they framing their fight for labor rights and really for civil rights. Uh, so by way of conclusion, um, and I realize I have gone over my time, I want to wrap up by, by kind of pointing this kind of main question, right, posing this question, what does the history of uh, Latino civil rights teach us? Um, and here, you know, this is what I, I kind of bring it all home and I want my students to understand. I want them to understand that context matters. Um, that the Latino civil rights history has to be understand in the, understood in the context of its time, um, that the conditions that groups experienced um, spurred, that, that kind of spurred the civil rights movement are um, historically contingent, right? What was happening at that moment? Um, in addition, when we think about the approaches that, that different groups took, that's also contextual too, right? What was available to them at a particular moment, that matters. Um, I want them to understand the relationships between the various civil rights movements. Um, you know, here it's what are the external factors that shaped Latino civil rights activism? And I think that the, it's really useful and instructive um, to offer some comparison. I mean, this is a, a kind of a go-to question that I often assign to my Texas history students, comparing and contrasting uh, the approaches and the conditions of Mexican Americans and African Americans, for example, and having them look at documents from each and to see where there are moments of convergence and where there's moments of, of uh, divergence in terms of, of what their experiences were. And so, um, you know, I think it helps us to understand how these different movements were inspiring one another, how they were influencing one another, how they sometimes existed separately, um, but how they all work together to create an environment for change. I want our students also to think about how civil rights is an evolving dialogue. Um, you know, I think for students, um, too often they want nice, simple answers, right? You know, things were difficult and challenging, and then things got better. Um, and I think sometimes we want those kinds of answers too, but it wasn't always the case, right? And that the struggle for civil rights um, is very much a continuous struggle, that despite major victories, whether it is a major landmark uh, Supreme Court case or winning a contract for, for uh, 
farm workers, um, that the struggle continues. And I think by acknowledging this, students then can recognize that you know, civil rights isn't something that happened before um, that they have no connection to. It's instead a way to kind of figure out how it relates to their world today and the issues that they face today. And finally, I want students to think about how communities tell their own stories. Um, you know, it's important, it's vitally important that students know who important figures are like the Lotus Huerta and Cesar Chavez and the, the critical role that they played in labor organizing. Um, but it's also important to understand uh, the role that many, many everyday people also played um, in, in uh, advancing the cause of civil rights. Um, and those stories matter. By emphasizing the grassroots, I think we get to see that a little bit better, right? That, um, that these histories are, are not just histories that happen uh, to somebody else or because one person has an idea, but, be but rather because people come together collectively. Um, and then how do people share and pass down those stories? Um, and as I promised, I would bring in uh, mural art. And so in the last couple of seconds here, um, mural art was one of those ways, right? And during the Chicano movement, it inspired the opportunity to share and tell a history that had not been told before. Again, one of these um, kind of critical pieces of self-determination. Um, here, I want to close with this beautiful uh, uh, mural, the legacy of Cesar Chavez uh, in, uh, that's at Santa Ana College in California. You know, and here you see key important figures, right? Um, you, you get the, the leaders of the, of the organization, but you also see everyday people who also made this movement happen. Um, and mural art is a wonderful way of claiming place, um, not only in neighborhoods, but also in, um, in our history books and uh, telling stories that are relevant to our communities um, and from their perspectives and also teaching future generations. Um, and so I, I apologize for going a little bit over time, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about this or any, any other uh, Latino history related topics that, that you have.